welcome uh, on behalf of the dean who cannot be with us today, but will be with us tomorrow morning. Uh, I want to welcome you to uh, the Berkeley Law School and thank you very much for accepting to participate uh, in this symposium on the intellectual legacy of uh, someone uh, who has uh, given us a lot to think about. Um, I cannot understand those who write on law asking abstractly, what is law? Yeah. How can that question be answered without asking another, why do you want to know? Um, as you immediately know, I'm not the author of this question. <laughs> yes. They were written more than 50 years ago uh, by, and if I may quote once more, a 40 years old American lawyer with some experience in teaching law, serving bureaucracies, arguing cases, drafting legislation, and writing legal history. Judging would be added to this impressive CV about 10 years later. So Judge Noonan knew not only why he wanted to know about the law, but he also knew how he could know about the law. And how he did it? He did it, and I quote again, by placing the person at the center of our understanding of the law. And a proposal which might look simple, but which in fact implies many uh, understandings and acknowledging the diversities and similarities of the complexities of the legal cultures, legal practice, and legal systems. He was an enlightener, and he spoke with courage to stand for values. He didn't hide behind also the mask of science, the mask of history, or the mask of the law. He spoke for his beliefs, which he believed were historically which historically define humanities. He was an enlightened reader of the fundamental text of our legal traditions. He was aware, for instance, of the ancient definition of law, which was repeated by Grecian in this famous compilation of canon law in the 12th century, the Concord of Discord and Canons, that Judge Noonan translated in a much better way as the harmony of an harmonious canon, yes. Uh, this definition of law, jus autem dictum quia justum est, and I do not need to translate it in front of so many Yuri's doctor. Yes. Uh, we are very uh, pleased, Peter and I, that you accepted to participate in this, in this symposium, and Peter will say now a Thanks. few words. So just delighted to see everybody here today. I thought I'd add a quick word about how this all came about. Um, I clerked for Judge Noonan in the early 90s, and before that, Laurent had been my uh, mentor and friend here at uh, Bolt Hall. Um, after Judge Noonan passed away in 2017, we started talking about what would be uh, a fit way to acknowledge the breadth of his legacy. Um, you know, I've had many occasions to remark that when people get together who've been associated with Judge Noonan, um, the, the force of his intellect and uh, his warmth and humor and the depth of his humanity immediately cause you to reflect on how he has impacted you. And you begin coming out with anecdotes and reminiscences, and that's great. We wanted to, to have a space for that, but we also wanted to add substance. And that's why we came up with the various uh, sessions that we've organized um, the events today and tomorrow into. Law, um, history, uh, ethics, religion, all trying to bring together strands of Judge Newton's um, uh, rich, rich contribution. So we hope that um, today will be, and today and tomorrow will be stimulating, um, and I hope that you'll enjoy it um, just as much as we've enjoyed putting it all together. Thank you. I had the special privilege of working alongside Judge John Noonan as his colleague on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals for more than 30 years. We came onto the court about the same time, he in December of 1985, and I, his immediate junior, in seniority less than a year later. But our family connections went back many years before to when my Mora-to-be and John's Mary Lee-to-be worked at Harvard together, Mora at the law school and Mary Lee at the business school during the late 1950s and 60s. 
Many years later, the Noonan's daughter Susie and our daughter Megan would matriculate here at Berkeley together. By the time John and I met on the court in the late 80s, I was still quite well aware of his uh, towering reputation as an intellectual giant, and I had some sense of who John Noonan was as a thinker and as a person, but working alongside John gave me a special view into how he thought and decided those many difficult issues with which he engaged. Indeed, our work on the court exposed us to questions no less varied than, and occasionally as fraught as, those that were at the heart of John's manifold scholarly pursuits. He and I served together as judges in more than 200 cases, which dealt with subjects as wide ranging as the constitutionality of a prison practice, which subjected women to invasive searches at the hands of male prison guards, or allegations of juror tampering in the trial of a man for the murder of two California police officers, to say nothing of the august question of whether a greeting card company could sell cards depicting a caricature of professional celebrity Paris Hilton, repeating her ubiquitous catchphrase, that's hot. <laughs> Although we diverged occasionally on some legal issues, John and I agreed on so much. By my count, he and I disagreed fewer than 20 times in more than 200 court decisions. Indeed, in my work with John Noonan, I'm struck by the very subject of our first session this morning, his abundant compassion for his fellow man. In his scholarship, in his approach to the law, and in his life, Judge Noonan cared most about people. Restoring the person to the center of legal process was Judge Noonan's enduring mission. Indeed, he dedicated an entire book to the subject, Persons and Masks of the Law. I know this aspect of John Noonan's jurisprudence firsthand. For example, I once joined him in an opinion which held that the public might be entitled to view per photos that depicted the death of Vincent Foster, former deputy counsel to President Clinton, but which noted that the responsible agency also had to consider how releasing the photos might affect Foster's surviving family members. In a case that on the surface might appear mired in government agency procedure, Judge Noonan emphasized the human, writing, and I'll quote, the applicable law protects a zone of privacy in which a spouse, a parent, a child, a brother, or a sister preserves the memory of the deceased loved one. To violate that memory is to invade the personality of the survivor. The intrusion of the media would constitute invasion of an aspect of human personality essential to being human, the survivor's memory of the beloved dead." End quote. I'm especially proud to have joined Judge Noonan in one of the most prominent moments of his on our court and in an opinion that might best exemplify his attention to the person before him, even when he disagreed with her case. His majority opinion in 1995, holding that the United States Constitution does not compel a state to allow its citizens to invoke physician-assisted suicide to end their lives, a decision later unanimously upheld by the United States Supreme Court, even as he rejected the claim that the United States Constitution protects such a right to bring about one's own death through physician-assisted suicide, Judge Noonan wrote this, and I quote, no one can read the accounts of the sufferings of the deceased plaintiffs supplied by their declarations or the accounts of the sufferings uh, 
of their, par their, their patients supplied by their physicians without being moved by them. No one would inflict such sufferings on another or want them inflicted on himself. And since the horrors recounted are those that could attend the end of life, anyone who reads them must be aware that they could be attendant on his own death. The desire to have a good and kind way of forestalling them is understandably evident in the declarations of the plaintiffs and the decision of the district court." End quote. Well, those litigants failed in their effort to assert a constitutional right to end one's own life with the help of a physician. But as disappointed as they surely were by the outcome of our decision, they still knew that the court before them understood and cared about the humanity and dignity of the terminally ill patients that they represented. To Judge Noonan, it was important, indeed vital, that every party receive that same message. We begin this first session of the conference on John Noonan's legacy with two presenters this morning, both former law clerks to Judge Noonan, who were especially well positioned to discuss law and the person. We will hear first from Professor Julie Oside, law clerk to Judge Noonan in 1986, and now a professor of legal research, writing, and lawyering at the University of St. Thomas Law School, and a faculty member at the National Judicial College. In addition to her work in the Legal Academy, Professor Oside is also a presidency scholar and is currently writing a book based on her series of articles about eloquent American presidents. Professor Oside will lead our session with a presentation of her paper, I See You, Judge John T. Noonan Writing with Empathy to Prove that the Human Person is Central to the Law. Following Professor Oside, we will hear from Richard Church, law clerk to Judge Noonan in 1998, and now a partner at KLN Gates in Chicago, where his practice focuses on health care. In addition to his legal work, Dr. Church holds a PhD in theological ethics from Duke University and has previously taught medical ethics at Wingate University. Dr. Church will present his paper, Medical Care for Undocumented Immigrants, a Noonan-inspired inquiry. Comments and questions will be welcome after we hear from both. So Professor Oside, you may now proceed. Long before he became a judge, Judge John T. Noonan Jr. recognized and highlighted the central place of the human person in any account of the law. One of his intellectual legacies as a Federal Circuit Court judge was recognizing the persons, not masks, who appeared before him. How did he do it? Empathy. Judge Noonan's own words from 2007 capture his judicial philosophy. This is a quote, from my perspective, it is this conviction at one's inner core, uniting principles and experience and empathy that counts most in judging, end quote. Judge Noonan's capacity for empathy as a judge extended beyond his ability to step into the shoes of someone whose life was very different from his own. He was able to write about that person's experience with the law so that you, as the reader, also feel that empathy for the person. Um, this presentation will focus on Judge Noonan's opinions in three areas of law spanning th his three decades on the court, civil rights, employment, and criminal law. Judge Noonan believed that you cannot love someone you cannot see. 
I will focus on how his judicial writing, his word choice, his concision, and the narrative techniques he used in his opinions furthered his philosophy of respecting the dignity of every human being. He saw them, we do too. So let's just start with this word empathy. What is it and how do we achieve it? The subtle difference between the words sympathy and empathy are often lost today. It's not surprising because the root of, be of both words is the Greek pathos, um, meaning feelings. But there is a distinction. We feel for another in sympathy. We feel as another in empathy. It has this element of personal experience, of a vicarious experience, as we identify with the feelings, thoughts, and opinions of another. So you heard the working title of my presentation, I See You, but what I suppose I really mean is, I feel what you feel in empathy. Judge Noonan didn't just see and hear the parties. He had both the imagination and humility to feel their experience. And I want to emphasize those two words, imagination and humility. Because Judge Noonan pointed out that not everyone in every situation has that imagination. He said that Cardozo's imposition of costs in all courts against Helen Paul's graph in the famous Paul's graph case was the decision that seemed least humane. Judge Nunes suggests that Cardozo did not have the imagination to see what a gigantic financial burden he had placed on Helen Paul's graph. She was in debt to her doctor, her lawyer, and now because of that judicial decision, her adversary. Judge Noonan wrote, only a judge who did not see who was before him could have decreed such a result. Imagination alone, of course, is not enough to give a person the capacity for empathy. Judge Noonan wrote of the destructive use of imagination made by the lawyers who viewed Africans arriving in America as property. What these lawyers lacked was humility and humanity. Judge Noonan noted that the lawyers in the United States who kept slavery in existence could believe in the natural law of freedom and champion emancipation and enforce slavery so long as the legal universe was a special world with its own rules. George Wythe, the lawyer who taught the others, Judge Newton said, had to suppress humanity in himself. So Judge Noonan gave us some insights into what he thought about em 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 empathy. As early as 1955, he talked about how law teachers must employ empathy when evaluating whether a case is right. He noted that law is not simply social engineering if the phrase connotes only the management of social interests for the public good. He said what is required here is an empathetic identification with the parties, an ascertainment of their reasonable expectations by an imaginative projection into the concrete situation. What the law teacher must call on here is his own developed sense of fairness, his own educated ability to empathize. His premise in the 1975 forward to persons and masks of the law is often quoted. And that is where he talks about how, well, I'll just read the quote. You probably know it well. The central problem, I think, of the legal enterprise is the relation of love to power. We can often apply force to those we do not see, but we cannot, I think, love them. Only in the response of person to person can Augustine's sublime fusion be achieved, in which justice is defined as love serving, only the one loved. By 2002, in the new forward, now with 15 years on the bench, he used the word empathy in the new preface. He said, attention to the person in these modest ways are exercises in empathy. And then he gave some specific examples. He suggested stating a criminal sentence in years, not months. Being respectful of the defendant by including both of the defendant's names and not misspelling the defendant's name. He specified additional situations that call for empathy. In asylum cases, quote, an effort at imaginative identification with the asylum seeker is necessary for the judge 
end quote. And when religious freedom is claimed, then, quote, a degree of vicarious identification with the believer is essential for the judge, end quote. I love those words he used, imaginative identification, vicarious identification. And that's what I mean when I talk about empathy here. But how do we gain that capacity for empathy? Again, Judge Noonan gave us guidance. He delivered the Constitutional Law Day lecture at the University of Tulsa College of Law in 1986. He concluded that conscience, that inner guide, counts most in judging. Of course, a judge's relationship with others, including his parents, his spouse, his children, will help mold the mind, the sensibility, the capacity for empathy that affects judgment. And he said all experience, including the religious experience that you've had, the, the job experience you've had, will count. But he also recognized that personal experience wasn't necessary. Again, in Persons and Masks in the Law, he noted that Cardozo never married and never had children. Thus, he lacked that experience of what it would be like to be Helen Paul's graph. He said that was not a disqualification from deciding issues on marriage or parenthood. He wrote, personal experience is scarcely necessary to judge the quality of an act or relationship. In what I think is the shortest sentence in the book, he wrote, empathy suffices. I'll end with what Judge Noonan said when he compared Henry James and a judge. It was once written in praise of Henry James that he had too fine a mind to have an idea. That is, James could not be read as writing from anything but an empathetic identification with the characters he cherished as persons. So too, a judge should be seen as responding to the persons in the case before him, bringing not ideology, but the response of a person to a person within the context cast by law. So I said I'd talk about three cases with a focus on the empathy and the technique he used, and then some of the writing and legal analysis <laughs> techniques. I chose three cases to support my point that the human person is central to the law. So a valid question is, why these three? And I'll tell you why I chose these three. First, they span Judge Noonan's career. One was decided in 1988, one in 1998, and one in 2015. Second, they are short opinions. One takes up just over two pages in the Federal Reporter. The other two are a scant page and a half, which shows that you don't need a lot of space to have empathy. Um, in my book about our most eloquent presidents, I use Abraham Lincoln as my example of a writer who knew the persuasive power of brevity, and I didn't think Judge Nino would mind if I made a comparison between his work <laughs> and Abraham Lincoln's. Judge Noonan himself knew the power of brevity. He talked about how Holmes used it. His succinct prose was used deliberately to make an impact. Third, I pick cases where the facts and the law don't necessarily scream empathy. Um, it's in these subtle, some may even call them mundane cases, where Judge Noonan shows that empathy is just as essential as in a case where even the hard-hearted would feel that empathetic response. And then finally, I chose cases addressing legal subject areas that I think others might overlook. This is not at all intended to diminish Judge Noonan's incredible work in immigration, death penalty case cases, religious liberty cases, and assisted suicide cases. But it is a way for me to demonstrate his consistent approach. No matter who appeared before him, and no matter what the underlying legal issue was. So let's start. The first opinion is Johnston versus Copps. Um, it was the, a Ninth Circuit case from 1988. Judge Noonan told the story of how a government lawyer favorable to the right of abortion and public funding for abortion attended a hearing of the California legislature without her supervisor's permission. He then held, when she was demoted, that she had a colorable 1983 claim based on her First Amendment assembly rights. I think this shows Judge Noon's capacity for empathy perhaps better than any of my other cases, and it builds on what Judge O'Scanlan just said. Finding empathy when you actually disagree with someone else's opinions and views. That is a tr that's a tremendous amount of empathy and something that not all humans are capable of. Um, 
I suspect that he connected to Johnston's underlying emotion, which likely combined disappointment, anger, and frustration at not being able to share her views. So Joyce Johnston, just a brief recitation of the facts, was an attorney working for the Department of Health Services. She asked for two hours of vacation time to attend this hearing, and she was denied that request. Nonetheless, she attended the hearing. She did not make any public statements or speak at the hearing. One of her supervisors was angry that she attended the hearing because he knew that staff members might be called on to testify, and Johnston, as a supporter of using public funds for abortion, did not agree with the policies of the office. The day after the hearing, she lost her status as a lead attorney and was transferred to a lower position. She filed a grievance, and ultimately her request was changed from um, you, you weren't supposed to go to, they allowed her to have vacation time, retroactively vacation time. The district court denied the cross motions for summary judgment and the defendants appealed. So what did Judge Noonan do? The defendants claimed qualified immunity because they said they did not violate any clearly established constitutional norm. Not so, said Judge Noonan, writing for the panel, which also included Judge O'Scanlan and Judge Kolsch. Judge Noonan used several writing techniques to show his empathy toward Johnston and make us, even those who, like him, disagreed with the underlying views, um, feel that same empathy. First, he acknowledged the gravity of the underlying issue. He wrote, Abortion and abortion rights are matters of great public concern. The consciences of citizens are divided on them." End quote. You can't argue with that. Because the issue is one of such great public concern, then any reader, no matter what you feel about that, can relate to Johnston's conviction and the emotions that accompany such a conviction. Second, he stated a well-accepted universal right. Just like any citizen, even though she was a public employee, she had a right to let the legislature know of her conscientious concern. Again, we can relate to her plight because we too want to know that we have the right to talk to our legislators about issues of great public importance. Third, he relied on the controlling legal rule. He noted that Johnston did not attend the meeting during working hours. Remember, she was retroactively granted vacation time. And thus, she was on her own time and had the ability to attend and make her views known. Fourth, um, he faced head on the counter arguments made by the defendants. One supervisor raised the affirmative defense that he acted in good faith because he relied on the advi advice of a lawyer. But Judge Noonan pithily wrote, quote, four difficulties attend his argument, end quote. And then he <laughs> eviscerated every single one of those arguments in a separate sentence. Um, concluding that he could not find good faith when the advice from the lawyer was from a subordinate based on incorrect facts, sought in part after the action, and not addressed to constitutional rights at all. He also dismissed any claim that Johnson violated a professional norm by putting her in conflict with the interests of her client. Again, he's an expert in professionalism issues, and um, he said that when an employee is acting in a professional capacity, then loyalty to, to a client might have to take precedence, but not when an employee is acting in a personal capacity. Fifth, he used vivid language. He emphasized that loyalty to a client does not require, quote, extinguishment of a lawyer's deepest convictions, end quote. The word extinguishment is such a great word choice, I think. It helps you visualize and feel the fire that she had for her conviction. He said she was sharing her views, quote, on her own time, end quote, which I love. Again, I think it's just a very vivid way of saying what her rights were and our own understanding of what our freedoms are when we are on our own time. And finally, he repeated the word conscience that was the crux of the case. Um, twice he used the word conscience, and once again he used the same root word by saying that she wanted to let the le legislators know of her conscientious concern. Okay, the second case is when Judge Noonan was sitting on the Third Circuit by designation. 
Diana v. Goodwill Industries, which was decided in 1998. So Judge Noonan vividly described how a Goodwill employee had previously been able to start work because she had keys to the building. Quote, a privilege she relished. He then held that a reasonable jury could find her removal from this position was an adverse employment action. And it was the word relished that struck me in this case. Most lawyers would say she appreciated the ability to get to work early, or she liked having the keys to the building, um, not Judge Noonan. He chose the word relish, which conjures this positive sensory experience. And he connects that word to a daily experience. And can't we all right here imagine some daily experience we have that we relish? So what did Judge Noonan relish in his daily routine? I think probably many things, but the one I learned of when I first started clerking with him was that he told me when he was a professor here at Berkeley, he walked each day from his home to campus, and then at the end of the day walked home. When I moved to California, I think that John, Becky, and Susan were all between 14 and 17 years old, somewhere in that range. And we all know that they were and are delightful people. But we also know that a house full of children might cut into your reflection time. <laughs> I don't know for sure, but I suspect that Judge Noonan's daily routine of walking to work and walking home gave him empathy for anyone else who had carved out a tiny piece of their day um, for a quiet space and gave him that ability to empathize with Christine Diano's plight when her employer took that daily experience away from her. So the facts of the case were that she was hired by Goodwill in 1992. Her formal description was a tagger processor, but she really just tagged the clothing, meaning that she identified the, bre the brands and priced the clothes. Two years after she started working, she was promoted to acting sales supervisor. One perk of the job was, quote, possession of the keys to the store, enabling her to start her work early, a privilege she relished, end quote. The store manager then began asking her personal questions, declared his love for her, and when he was, when um, Diano asked him to leave, he told her, you're gonna be demoted to doing processing. She actually reported the incident to a female supervisor who told her she was being non-supportive of management and she would have to process clothing. Diano told the manager that she couldn't. She said, I'm phobic of critters, dead or alive, that we find in donation bags, mice, insects, bugs. Um, she provided a letter from her physician which actually confirmed this phobia, but she was ordered to go through the bags. She, and this is how Judge Noon described it, quote, attempted to comply, broke down, trembling and crying, and left, end quote. So Chief, um, Chief Judge Becker and Judge Nygaard from the Third Circuit judge joined Judge Noonan in this opinion. And they held that a transfer to a job that an employer knows an employee cannot do can be an adverse employment action. So what are the techniques Judge Noonan here, used here? First, his legal analysis from the very beginning focused on the person. He noted that the law required judges to determine what constitutes retaliation by looking at what a person in the plaintiff's position would reasonably understand. True, the reasonably understand test is actually pretty broad, but it requires the empathy of putting yourself in that person's position, which sounds eerily the same as putting yourself in someone else's shoes, the definition of empathy. And he followed that rule with a directive to consider the individual standing before the court. A person's job-related attributes are important in deciding whether a lateral transfer was an adverse employment language. He used such vivid language, that's the second thing he did in this opinion. I've already made much of his use of the word relish. But he used several other words to emphasize the distinction between what a processor did and what a tagger did. He wrote that processors, quote, sorted out the bags in which the donated clothes were dumped, end quote. I mean, dumped is a great word. There are other words you could have chosen, but that is a very vivid word. And I don't think it was chosen at random. It adds heft to his point that Diana's fear of critters made her unable to actually process those clothes. 
In holding that these facts might amount to an adverse employment action, he said, quote, a reasonable jury could find that Christine Diano's employment was substantially worsened, end quote. Again, I don't think that word substantially was chosen at random. Third, he used vivid details to paint a picture. You can actually picture this entire event. Um, her fear of critters, dead or alive. She, that was a quote that she had said in, earlier in the case. Um, instead of saying that she just tried to comply and couldn't, he said what I earlier quoted. She attempted to comply, broke down, trembling and crying, and left. So to much, just painting, oops, a very vivid picture. Um, fourth, he stated the rule and then contrasted it with other situations that were not job related. For example, that you don't want to live in a certain city. He said, no, that's not the same. That's not the same. Fifth, he backed the rule up with citations and parentheticals. He cited a case from the First Circuit holding that setting an employee up to fail could be an adverse employment action. A case from the Second Circuit holding that reassigning to a job requiring a five-story climb when the employer knew the employee couldn't make that kind of climb could be retaliatory. And finally, a Third Circuit case holding that when the school board knew the plaintiff would quit if he were denied paternity leave, then that could be a constructive discharge. So the third case is a very recent case, um, United States versus Padrin from the Ninth Circuit in 2015. And here he uses yet another temp empathy technique. He's so great at this. He has all these different methods of finding empathy in situation. He explained how the government enticed the defendant with psychological tricks to participate in a crime. He was actually unsuccessful in this case. He was the minority opinion, and he was unsuccessful in his attempt to ask the Ninth Circuit to rehear the case on Bonk and decide whether the defendant had been entrapped. I use the, I call the empathy technique he used in this case the run it by the non-expert um, technique. He wanted to know always how non-lawyers would react to what was happening in the law. And let me give just two examples of how this worked for Judge Noonan. Um, first, at least while I was clerking for him in 1986, he spent a significant amount of time every day with non-lawyers. I may get the details wrong, but here's how I remember it. The car commute from the East Bay area into San Francisco, the Noonans lived in the East Bay area and still do, required travel on the busy Bay Bridge. As I remember, Judge Noonan waited somewhere, I don't remember where, and those from, you from the Bay Area might know what I'm talking about, to be picked up by someone who was gonna be going across the bridge and going into downtown San Francisco. Um, this casual carpooling <laughs> allowed cars with three passengers to shave, I think, up to 20 or 25 minutes off the commute time. And as I recall, there was an added bonus where you didn't have to pay a toll. Maybe this is still happening. Um, I haven't lived in the Bay Area for a long time. But I think that's how Judge Noonan got to work most days in 1986 when I worked for him in San Francisco. I don't suggest that Judge Noonan ever discussed any confidential information with any of his fellow passengers. Of course he didn't. Um, but I do suggest this was an ingenious way to keep in touch with non-lawyers and to see what, um, what others thought about what was happening in the law. When evaluating a question, what makes a judge great, Judge Noonan looked at empirical data, including the education of seven judges who he thought might qualify as great judges. And he noted that all seven, quote, were soaked in the social consciousness of their period, end quote. My point is that this daily commute gave him a way to be soaked in the social consciousness of the day. Second, I saw this practice even more starkly. Um, during the end of Judge Noonan's life. So during the last five years of Judge Noonan's life, my husband Jeff and I were lucky enough to find ourselves in the Bay Area in December every year of the last five years of Judge Noonan's life. So we often visited Judge and Mrs. Noonan at their breathtakingly lovely home. I'm seeing so many smiles because if you've been there, you know exactly what I mean. Just the warmth of the place, the beauty of the place. We love the conversation, reminiscing about the old days, talking about children, talking about current events. 
Judge Noonan would often talk about recent cases that had been decided, and one episode stands out, and that's because I now know it was this case. It was the Pedrin case. He shared some of the facts while he was preparing to urge the court to rehear the case on Bach. But here is the memorable thing. He did not care at all what I thought. <laughs> He was focused with a razor sharp intensity on my husband, who is not a lawyer. Um, he peered intently into Jeff's eyes and said, this is what the government did. Does that seem like something the government should do, <laughs> Jeff? So again, a way to check with non-lawyers about what's happening in the law. Um, as I said, Judge Noonan was on his own for this opinion. Judge Fletcher and Judge Christian were also were on the original pan panel, but he was unsuccessful in his, his attempt to get the case reheard. Just let me tell you what he did in his opinion, though. He wrote about the facts, and he separated them into the two primary legal questions. One was whether the government relied on psychological tricks to persuade Padrin to participate in the crime, and the second was whether Padrin was predisposed to commit the crime. So he emphasized four facts in showing what he thought were psychological tricks. First, and I'm going to just quote from the case. First, the confidential informant was co-defendant Omar Perez's uncle, and therefore someone to whom Perez and Padrin, a close friend of Perez's, were more likely to succumb than they otherwise might. Then he pointed out that this uncle peer pressured them by saying the government was very cool people, and I'm sure that's a quote, but I love that that's in a Judge Noonan opinion, <laughs> very cool people, um, and that he wanted to do the job and suggested he'd, he'd find others to do the job if they wouldn't. Third, he said the government put time pressure on them. You need to make a decision quickly about whether you're going to participate in this crime or not. And fourth, the government removed, quote, some of the moral qualms by saying that he had no love for the drug dealers because they actually owed him money. For the second legal issue, Padrin's predisposition, Judge Noonan noted that the government knew nothing about him and nothing in his record suggested that he would participate in this kind of crime. It was a stash house burglary crime. He reviewed the details of the prior record and, and just concluded there's nothing there that shows he's predisposed. Only an unreliable narrator who had a lot to gain and who was 10 years older than Padrin said that Padrin previously committed this kind of crime but there was no independent corroborating evidence. So what did he do in this case? Once again, he used this incredibly vivid language. When the United States Supreme Court um, recognized the entrapment defense in 1932, they used the word lure once. Judge Newton used it three times. Um, just very, very impactful use of that word. He also used other vivid words, dangling, to describe the government's behavior. Dangling before Padrin, a scheme that was rich in payoff and involved little work or risk. Isn't that word dangling perfect way for him to make his point? And he also used the word tricks when he talked about what the government did relying on psychological tricks. Second, he wove, in this case, he wove the facts and law together. Sometimes you'll see opinions where they're completely separated. Here, he wove the facts and laws together, law together to create a seamless story about how the government put this psychological pre pressure to entice Padrin to commit the burglary. Third, he incorporated many stories into the opinion. He gave three examples from precedent cases to show that the government, like the government in these prior cases, had used psychological tricks. In Sorrell's, the government agent was, like Sorrell's, a war veteran who relied on this status to pressure Sorrell's into getting him liquored. In Sherman, the government relied on an informant who was, like Sherman, a recovering drug, drug addict and who resorted to sympathy to persuade Sherman to buy the drugs. And then finally in Jacobson, the government put pressure on Jacobson by repeatedly sending him mailings, tempting him to purchase the illegal materials. Again, it's so vivid and it's just so visual for me, the way he summarizes these stories. And finally, he made this subtle reference to a device from fiction, the unreliable narrator. <laughs> 
right? Um, he, he stated that the legal standard requires the government to prove predisposition beyond a reasonable doubt. And all you've got is this unreliable narrator who's going to have a sentence cut in half and who is much older and more experienced than Mr. Padrin. So I hope you'll indulge me in one final story. The book ends to how I met and ultimately said goodbye to Judge Noonan as I conclude my paper. So when visiting my friend's family home in Milwaukee in the fall of 1985, I grabbed the November 4th, 1985 Time magazine off the coffee table because at their house you were expected to be dis able to discuss current events at the dinner table. So it was a little bit of cramming. <laughs> Grab that Time magazine off. Inside was a story that would change my life. Here are the lines I remember. At the appellate level, President Reagan has chosen a number of stars. John Noonan is one of the five smartest guys in the world, says one justice official proudly. Once I learned that the Senate had confirmed Judge Noonan, I, I called him. I was 24 years old. Yes, I called him. Out of the blue, this was not something I normally did, but such was my fervor in hoping to secure a clerkship with him. I used the phone in the Minnesota Law Review and dialed his phone number at the Berkeley Law School, and he answered. He actually answered. <laughs> Um, I explained that I had had a clerkship lined up, but my judge retired and it sort of was disappearing before my eyes. I asked if he needed a clerk for the fall of 1986. He said he'd already hired his clerks for that year. And then he said, but I don't have all my clerks hired now. What are you doing now? I said, I'm moving to San Francisco. <laughs> Which I did four days later, moved to San Francisco. So I was with him when he started um, when he started his judgeship. Thirty one years after I first heard his voice, I sat at Judge Noonan's funeral, as many of you did, at St. Albert's Priory, which is a beautiful, serene, classic, and peaceful place. My daughter Olivia and I arrived early and sat in the second row of stalums. Those are these beautifully carved wooden seats face, facing each other a lot across a large center aisle. I was seated directly next to a small aisle separating the second set of stalums from the first set because the first set of stalums had been reserved for the eulogists, including Judge O'Scanlan, and then John, who was also a eulogist at the funeral, was on the other side of the stalums. Um, but immediately before the service began, there were a few seats, very few seats left, so people started sitting in those first rows. The man who chose to sit in the small aisle next to me was a bit disheveled and seemed a little bit confused. But he responded appropriately, laughing lightly when you just made wry remarks about Judge Noonan and remaining somber during the rites of the Mass. During the Mass, there's a thing called the sign of the peace. And it's an opportunity for the congregation to share handshakes along with the spoken hope that peace be with you to those sitting near them. During the sign of peace, the man who sat across that aisle from me turned to me, broke into a huge grin, and enthusiastically shook my hand. I've been a Catholic my whole life, and the sign of the peace has been part of the Catholic tradition since I was a very young child. So I don't know how many signs of peace experiences I've had, but I'm telling you this was the warmest. <laughs> I thought maybe this man came to the funeral for this very moment, the chance to touch and interact with another person. And then it was my turn to smile. I thought this is perfect, just so perfect, because directly next to this man was a sign that said dignitaries. And I thought those were Judge Noonan's dignitaries. He recognized them. Ooh. <laughs> he had an incredible ability to see the humanity in all, to see and feel what it was like to be a, a defendant entrapped by the government, a death row inmate, an asylum seeker with no one on your side, the illegally deported immigrant, the person who wanted to share her views publicly on abortion, and even the employee clinging to that small set of freedom that she had, clinging to that tiny bit of scheduling freedom. He used his gift of empathy, his razor sharp understanding of the law, and his stellar writing style to also let us see and feel what it, was be like, what it would be like to be the persons who are inextricably part of the law. Thank you.
Lovely. And now let me call upon Dr. Church to present. Great, and thank you, Julie. If, if you all didn't pick up that connection, and we didn't coordinate this, but I was on the court in 1998, and I, I remember very much the critters and the mice in the Goodwill bag when we went to the Third Circuit and uh, the research we did uh, for that case. So was, um, that was one he was very passionate about, as, as you can imagine. Um, well, first of all, let me thank everyone uh, for the opportunity to be here, for Mrs. Noonan and the conference organizers. Um, if you read the, you know, the list of folks attending, you'll you'll notice it's it's very easy. Peter, you may be in this bucket as well, but everyone's alike but one, and <laughs> so I'm really honored to be here as a as a practicing attorney, um, and. Uh, and share some of my recollections of Judge Noonan, uh, some of my work that we had done writing on him, um, even back in the 2000s, but, but then a, a Noonan-inspired in inquiry. I did ask the, the conference organizers that 15 years out of the conversation, I thought I'd be better served to write on something I actually knew about, <laughs> but that I felt Judge Noonan would be deeply passionate about, given his immigration work. I also want to thank and make clear that I have two co-authors on this paper, um, and if there's probably one thing that you learn from Judge Noonan, it's hopefully how to begin to mentor young and very, very bright lawyers that we all had the opportunity to do in his chambers. So Leah um, uh, Richardson is a senior associate in the KNL Gates healthcare practice, um, a brilliant second career lawyer, was a chemist at GlaxoSmithKline before we snagged her into the, to the law, and um, a passionate Catholic. So she was one of my picks to, to co-author and work with me on this, and it's been great fun to introduce um, her to Judge Noonan and, and his legacy. And the other one is a, is a very young lawyer, uh, UCLA trained, no offense to the Berkeley folks, but um, uh, just, a, a, again, a brilliant young man, Kenneth Kennedy. Um, you can't spend an hour with Ken without understanding his commitment to justice, and given uh, Judge Noonan's commitment to justice, he was a, a natural to work with me on this paper. There are a host of other KNL Gates associates that um, committed time and effort to this project as we cataloged um, the treatment of undocumented immigrants and the access to medical care in various key states that um, have large undocumented populations um, and where we have offices and, and, um, and young associates that worked on this. So I'm, I'm really grateful to the, the entire KNL Gates team and could not be here without, without the work they've done. I had a great great fun at dinner uh, with Judge Fletcher last night. I did not realize his um, mother was one of the early members of the Preston Gates firm, long before it was Preston Gates even. Um, and so we, we had a, a, a lot of fun reminiscing about how we got to the, the monolith that is K&L Gates today, <laughs> a global law firm, but, but started with, with some amazing roots in Seattle, including uh, Judge Fletcher's mother. Um, so as I mentioned, this is obviously a topic that anyone who worked in Judge Noonan's chambers would understand the importance to him. His commitment to immigrants was evidenced throughout his work. Um, it has been a key, key area that I have written about before, and it was certainly, I have to say, as a young law clerk, um, part of the job I had no uh, idea would be such an important part of the job, that, um, that immigration appeals would be such a, a key work of the, the court when I arrived here. Um, and so, um, obviously, we, we all know Judge Noonan's decision in Olympia Lazo Mahano, um, where he found that um, both an implied political commitment uh, committed to you by a, an oppressor could be uh, grounds for um, potentially asylum, and also really first articulated that um, uh, gender bias could be a political act and, and a, and a, and a um, and, and, and against a, uh, an asylum seeker. So obviously a, a critical opinion that has you know, shaped his work and, and shaped um, uh, many, many things within the immigration and my understanding based on um, some recent research that is now a position in the immigration um, 
even the INS uh, in its current form has now adopted. Um, but we, you know, we know many of his other opinions are key to the topics that we still face today in the immigration front, in the Agumon case, focusing on the lack of counsel and the detention of an immigrant and what he called the cruel necessity of detention of immigrants um, while they are awaiting uh, immigration status. And then also just to Julie's point, just the sheer humanity of his opinions. Um, uh, Salvador Castoron Garcia, just a, again a very simple case, but where he looked very, very carefully at a man 25 years in the U.S., went um, back to Mexico to, to actually to try to legalize his status, ended up staying longer than intended as a result of a birth of a child, um, and the INS had treated that as a non-casual um, stay within a foreign country and, and basically restarted the clock, which meant he would not be eligible for immigration status. And J Judge Noonan's opinion, again, is short, it's crisp, and it's just um, so direct to just the lack of humanity um, offered um, in, from a bureaucracy designed to fail. So with that, with that in mind, that is why we wanted to, to look at how our undocumented immigrants uh, facing the U.S. healthcare system. How are they managing that? How are they navigating that? Very much um, inspired by Julie's view that um, if we do not pay attention, and healthcare is very similar to law, um, it is a monolith. It can be considered at a macro level, but it is um, happening at a day-to-day, person-to-person level. How, how is a system, how as a nation, are we accommodating and finding health care for those in great need who are also under um, duress in many other ways, whether asylum seekers or, or um, with fear of, of government reprisal if they enter into our health care system. So that, um, that issue continues to obviously be resonant as a nation, um, and even in the short period before we um, decided on this, or when we decided on this topic and before we gathered here, as you're aware, this, this issue has been of, of national importance over just the, the summer. Um, we're all very, very aware of the conditions in detention facilities and the lack of health care that may be provided there. Again, Judge Fletcher, I think, just had an opinion um, in, in the middle of August, yet again addressing um, the care that and the conditions in detention facilities. You may be aware as well that the public charge rules were changed just over the last few weeks. Essentially, the public charge rules um, are a, uh, a look that any immigrant seeking legal status must um, uh, go through a review to determine if they are likely to become a public charge. Um, under historical guidance, that had been primarily tied to whether they were going to need cash assistance like Social Security benefits or long-term care benefits through the Medicaid program through a sweeping new rule um, that the Trump administration had proposed and now finalized, um, applying for Medicaid, receiving Medicaid will be a negative factor in uh, public charge decisions, along with receiving many, many other types of aid that will now be a negative factor in public charge determinations. Um, the interesting thing, uh, a consulting firm to the healthcare industry, um, just on the chilling effect alone that many immigrants who actually are not subject to the rule but will believe they are subject to the rule, estimated that $17 billion in Medicaid uh, reimbursement that hospitals otherwise would have received will be lost because immigrants will not seek their legal right to Medicaid status um, and then will ultimately present at U.S. healthcare systems without any payer source um, be delivered care and, and then that care will go uncompensated. And then finally, there was, a, again, a, a very short uh, flip on deferred action for medical emergencies. Over the middle of August, the Trump administration rolled back a rule that permitted deferred action for medical emergencies, and actually just earlier this week reversed course on that, I think, given the, the political backlash. So there is a, a tremendous amount of activity um, in this area as it relates to healthcare and immigration status, and it just felt to us that this would, would be a topic uh, worthy of, of attention given Judge Noonan's commitments in those areas.
So I, I again, if I'm, I'm, I see some heads nodding, I'm guessing some of you are very, very intimately familiar with the U.S. healthcare system. Others of you, this this may feel as esoteric a topic as as law and religion. <laughs> and so, I will try to um, to give a kind of a ten thousand foot view of of sort of what the lay of the land is today, and then just a few insights um, as someone who has um, worked in the healthcare industry for the last fifteen to twenty years, um, works day in day out with large academic medical centers and large health systems that, again, see immigrant populations walking through their doors every single day. On the federal level, you have to start in healthcare with understanding we actually have a universal healthcare system. Don't tell anyone in Washington that this is the case. But in fact, we do have an all-payer system in the US, and it's called the EMTALA law. Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with EMTALA. Others may, be not, uh, may not be. But under the EMTALA law, essentially, any person who walks into a hospital that's enrolled in Medicare and is in an emergency situation must be treated without regard to their payer status. They must receive receive both a, a screen to determine if they have an emergency medical condition and they must be treated and not transferred to another facility until that emergency medical condition is stabilized. So that means in the U.S., essentially anyone who walks into an ED will be treated, and that is the universal payer system for healthcare in the U.S. and where both undocumented immigrants and uninsured individuals often will receive their care. Dovetailing into that, interestingly then, is a Medicaid rule um, and a immigration rule that essentially the U.S. prohibits the use of federal funding for Medicare, Medicaid, the children's health program called CHIP, um, for any undocumented immigrant, uh, except for two exceptions. There is an exception for emergency medical care. So essentially, if an undocumented immigrant comes into a U.S emergency room and receives care, they can be qualified for short-term <laughs> Medicaid benefits to care for just that one um, emergency condition. And then there is also an ability to use federal funding dollars for um, prenatal care, um, which basically runs through the course of the pregnancy and 60 days after. Those are the only two areas in which federal dollars can be spent on uh, undocumented immigrants. Now, um, interestingly, in the same law that, that basically put that infrastructure together in 1996 under the Clinton administration, um, they did uh, do something very, very helpful for undocumented immigrants. And that is, there is a network, as you may be aware, of safety net facilities in the US that provide primary care to uninsured folks. Those are often called federally qualified health centers, community mental health centers, and they tend to be HRSA, um, the Health Resources Services Administration, grant-funded entities. So in the same law that prohibited the use of Medicare and Medicaid dollars being spent on undocumented immigrants, the government did take the position and it is a U.S. law that if you receive one of those federal grants to run a safety net facility, you must make the services you provide available to undocumented immigrants as well as documented immigrants and, and others. So that is, uh, again, in a, it's a very, uh, you know, Clinton was obviously a master at compromise and um, uh, th there was a give and a get in that 1996 law, which really has set the basic parameters for this. So what we then did is we looked at five key states that we thought would be, again, um, important to look at because they have large populations of undocumented immigrants. They're leading states from a policy perspective. Um, and uh, quite frankly, they're also states that were licensed and we know well and so um, made, made good sense for us to look at. And so we reviewed uh, California, Illinois, Florida, Texas, and North Carolina. And of course, what you would expect is, is not surprising. California is the most liberal state in terms of care for undocumented immigrants under a, a budget bill passed just last year that will become effective in 2020. California will now extend Medicaid for individuals up to, the, up to 25 years of age and younger. So, um, and again, just quick side note on the way Medicaid works is that's a, that's a, a joint funded program. States put funds in, the federal government puts funds in. So the prohibition at the federal level on using federal matching funds for Medicaid does not prevent a state from electing to spend its own dollars on expanding Medicaid beyond the scope of what is required or, or permitted under, under federal law. So that's what is essentially what California has done, is spending its own dollars to extend Medicaid benefits um, to undocumented immigrants up to the age of 25. Um, the other thing that California does, um, which actually Texas does as well, is does have a mandated county level 
payer of last resort or provider of last resort, where services must be avail made available to residents of, of every county uh, through a county public health department. That then leaves it up to the county to decide how they're going to, to, to handle that. And as you can imagine, if you look in Texas or you look in California, Orange County does not extend its uh, public benefit program at the Orange County level to undocumented immigrants. Los Angeles County does and has a very robust program to, to care for immigrants and documented and undocumented through that program. Um, that one made Kenneth quite proud and quite happy. I'll, I'll tell you that he was, he was always happy to to find uh, an Orange County, LA County uh, difference. <laughs> so um, Illinois, very similar, um, has extended the CHIP benefit, which again, CHIP is uh, just focused on minors, has extended the CHIP benefit to undocumented immigrants up to the age of 18, um, spending basically Illinois state tax dollars on that. And then Florida, Texas, and North Carolina, as you might expect, on, only provide health care um, at, at the minimum level that the federal government uh, will also fund at. So, um, and Florida uh, does not provide actually even prenatal. It's not a mandatory um, program that they have to provide it. It's simply that there are federal matching funds available, and it appears Florida does not provide it. So that's, that's, again, the overview of the land and uh, the lay of the land in terms of five key states. And, and I think it brings um, up a, a number of kind of key insights as, as we think about as a nation, as we think about in Judge Noonan's um, care for the person, how we might think about health care as we move forward. One of the interesting things I think as you map this out and, and as someone who lives in healthcare policy work on a regular basis, while the arguments around care for undocumented immigrants uh, will often be couched in, in a conversation around um, the use of healthcare and, and encouraging people to migrate that we don't want to migrate, things like that. If you look at how these states break out, they essentially break out along the same lines that they consider healthcare as a fundamental right for US citizens. So Texas, Florida, North Carolina, all did not expand Medicaid under the Accountable Care Act as they would have been permitted to do and have higher rates of uninsurance than California and Illinois, both of which have a much stronger commitment to healthcare as a universal right. So in other words, you, you basically see that the states are breaking out very, very similar to how they view healthcare availability for their, for their own um, uh, resident citizens, rather documented or undocumented. The second area that I think this points out, which is, uh, um, I think anyone who lives in the healthcare system and the healthcare payer system understands is kind of a fundamental given where we have um, probably not done ourselves as a service and maybe an area where there's a, an opportunity for, for policy, um, uh, co uh, policy consensus, even on the left and the right, is that under any conventional wisdom, uh, an emergency department is the highest cost setting to, to provide care. <laughs> so even if you don't believe in health care for undocumented immigrants, even if you don't believe in health care for, for U.S. citizens, pushing people into the emergency department is to spend the most potential dollars you could spend on health care. If you look at why our health outcomes differ so greatly from other countries that spend less money on us, it's, it's just absolute conventional wisdom that if you took a dollar that we spend on emergency or end-of-life care and moved that back into preventative health care or even more into health health care where you are changing social determinants of health and um, helping people avoid getting um, into situations where they have co significant comorbidities and uh, long-term diseases, you would, you would get tremendously more dollars, m more benefit in terms of overall population health. And so in the undocumented immigrant space, we have done essentially made the same mistake where we are spending the little amount of money that we spend in the place where we are getting the least benefit for that spending. And so that does suggest that there ought to be an opportunity for policy alignment on at least expanding the benefits available to put them in place before folks are in the emergency department, which again would be conventional wisdom both in the traditional healthcare debate um, and and was very much part of the the, the ACA conversation as well when when the um, the healthcare reform bill was being passed. 
So that's a, a again, it's kind of a feels like a no brainer, but it but it is something of note. Now, I one thing that is interesting, there's a very good UCLA study on the actual usage of healthcare by undocumented immigrants, and it's. In, it's important to note we don't really have, as a nation, very good data about what the cost of caring for undocumented immigrants are. The best data we have actually is, is that emergency room data because there is a federal payer and, and Medicaid can tell us what um, patients receiving that benefit have received. So there's, there's really very uh, limited data, but all the data we have would actually run contrary to all the things you would think are, are um, are, are the standard, which is undocumented immigrants are actually quite a bit healthier than uh, U.S. citizens or documented immigrants. Uh, undocumented immigrants use the health system much less than uh, U.S. Uh, citizens and non and non citizens with documented status, and and in particular use the ED much less. Um, and again, there's a lot of reasons for that. Some of that does have to do with population. There is a disproportionate share of young, healthy males in the undocumented immigrant population as compared to the U.S. population, for example, which is, is older and less healthy overall. But it, it is um, actually not accurate to think that part of what is breaking the healthcare system is care for undocumented immigrants, given, given they actually are, are much lower users of the, the healthcare system. Obviously, Beyond the scope of this paper, there are tremendous access barriers. There's, uh, as the uh, these consulting reports are noting, there's a, there's a great fear of basically undocumented immigrants to go into the U.S. healthcare system, um, well founded or not. There is a chilling effect that's there. Um, there are obviously language barriers that that impact that. There are very strict civil rights laws within the healthcare space that require uh, U.S. hospitals to have great availability for translators for patients. Those are, I will just tell you as a healthcare lawyer, those are heavily enforced and the Office of Civil Rights, even in the Trump administration, continues to enforce those laws with, with great vigor. So um, there, there is some hope there, but, but, it, but it is an access issue as well that, that leads to, to less use. Um, the, the next point is, again, very similar to the documented population in the U.S. Um, for the, they are underinsured or uninsured. This, this network of safety net facilities has become the true place that actual primary care and routine health care can be provided. So federally qualified health centers, community mental health centers, all these federal grantee uh, agencies provide the lion's share of the care. Um, and so that actually points out where, where we as practicing attorneys with large health systems see, see the real breakdown and real challenges for undocumented immigrants right now. So if you think about what I've laid out, essentially if you need primary care, you probably can go to a federally qualified health center. You're going to face long delays and, and be in a, in a big queue, but you will probably get primary care at the end of the day. If you are in an emergency condition, you will probably be able to get care in a, in a U.S. emergency department. So where the gaps in the treatment system that's available for patients tend to be is either when they get into the need for long-term specialty care or when they get into the need for long-term care. Um, and uh, on the specialty care front, so if you need, for example, cancer treatment, um, that's be beyond the expertise of a federally qualified health center there's not going to, you know, in until you're in an emergency situation where that cancer is actually impacting you in, in an emergency level, that's not going to, you're not going to go get infusions in the emergency department. So you have really very limited pathways to treatment for, for it in those contexts. Um, this is going to be a very, very important issue for the U.S. as we move forward. I, I will tell you, as we sit today, even for documented citizens on Medicaid, um, as new and advanced high cost drugs and therapeutics and diagnostics come online, um, U.S. hospitals are, are facing some very, very challenging choices right now. They're, if you're familiar with CAR-T therapy, this is really the, the most groundbreaking therapies that we've ever seen. You essentially take um, the patient's own blood, you send it to a drug company, they re-engineer the cells, and then you reinfuse that back into a patient. Um, the going price for that treatment is a million dollars. It's now commercially available in a, in a non-research um, setting. So if um, Medicaid pays less than full value for even the cost of the drug, which is really quite common in most states, 
um, and you are a healthcare provider, you may be making with every patient you elect to treat a decision to lose a million dollars. And so if you make that treatment available to undocumented immigrants, you know, maybe that's even more, and really how many, again, we, we will very, very soon face access decisions. U.S. healthcare providers have very, very difficult choices to make right now. There are um, strict non-discrimination laws uh, around Medicare and Medicaid patients. So essentially, U.S. healthcare may elect to not make high-cost drugs available because they need to make a, an across-the-board decision. They can't offer it for commercial patients, but not offer it for Medicare and Medicaid, and they simply cannot sustain the losses of making it available to Medicare, Medicaid, and uninsured patients. So that's going to be an issue that continues to, to vex us as a, as a healthcare system generally. It will certainly vex us even more um, in, for the un, undocumented immigrant population. The other area that's um, very, very much um, in play and, and very difficult to deal with is long-term care for undocumented immigrants. So essentially, if I'm an immigrant and I do come into a hospital, um, having been in a catastrophic accident, for example, and I um, have a traumatic brain injury and will need care for the rest of my life, um, the hospital has no ability to force a rehab hospital or a skilled nursing facility to take that patient. And so we literally have sitting in U.S. hospitals today undocumented immigrants that there is no, no place to send them. They are no longer acute, um, and, uh, and the hospital is caring for them at, at, at great cost because, they're, again, they're in the highest cost setting. So that's led to a couple of things, one of which you, you may be familiar, which has been high profile and led to some significant litigation, one that you're probably less familiar with, but is, is another um, humane way that hospitals are trying to, to, to solve for this. So one issue that has occurred is what's called medical deportation. And you, that's essentially, for a hospital, you will charter a private flight for thirty dollars or $40,000 and fly that um, individual back to their country of origin and put them into the public health system in their country of origin. Um, this is an issue that's been heavily litigated even back into the early 2000s um, as to whether this was either a violation of EMTALA, a violation of the patient's informed consent. There's, this is a, it's a very fraught practice, but it is a practice that is continued to uh, continues to be at least considered by many hospitals as they try to figure out how to handle these patients. The other thing we have seen that U.S. hospitals are now doing is actually entering into contracts with skilled nursing facilities to become payer of last resort for these uh, patients. So it, essentially, if you think about it from the hospital's perspective, if it's going to cost you a million dollars a year to care for this patient in an acute care bed, which otherwise is, is in your, uh, let's say, in a tertiary hospital referral center where those beds are at a premium for patients who need them, it's actually going to be less expensive for you to pay a skilled nursing facility to pay for that patient for the rest of their life at the skilled nursing facility level rate than it is to continue to house them in your hospital. So hospitals are actually entering into contracts with skilled nursing facilities to essentially pay for care for these patients because there is no, um, there is no other payer for them. Again, and if you've been in the healthcare debate, you sort of see where the US health system kind of goes awry and you, you sort of wonder, well, why do I pay so much for my insurance? And because this is essentially what you're, you're paying for. You know, you're, you're, if you're an insured member of the population, you're overpaying for healthcare because essentially your hospital provider has become an insurer um, through both the provision of uncompensated care and even now actually purchasing care for, for uninsured individuals. So, all of that suggests, again, um, if you've been in the healthcare uh, policy field for, for a while, these are probably not revolutionary questions, but they apply with acute severity to the undocumented immigration population, the un undocumented immigrant population. So um, I don't want to leave you on it just completely like <laughs> this is, well, that's a very hopeful um, paper. And I do, so I do want to end on, um, uh, on a very Noonan note in terms of the, the human person, because as I mentioned, I think healthcare is very much like the law. It can be presented as, as a monolithic system in the US. The reality is it is human beings walking through doors of US hospitals and individuals, social workers, physicians, nurses, that interact with those folks day in, day out. And um, in my experience in practice over the last 15 to 20 years, what I see is 
U.S. hospitals finding ways um, by hook or by crook to, to provide care, to continue to try to figure out solutions. They are, they are facing financial, um, again, and I'm not at all discounting that U.S. hospitals have done very well. I'm very familiar with um, concerns about their tax exemption and um, at, certain, at certain places, but they, they continue to be mission-driven organizations that find ways to do this. Um, I shared with Jeff, I'm in negotiations <laughs> with a client up, up to the minute I walked up here in terms of uh, my ability to share some of the examples that would not be patient specific, but would um, document the way that I think U.S. hospitals are doing really remarkable work um, for the benefit of these patients, um, finding um, new ways to fund and finance clinics that are that are really dedicated to, to meeting the needs we've described here. And so um, I, I do think these are solvable problems. I believe in uh, Judge Noonan's views. I'm also, um, as a academic, I trained heavily in Catholic theology and Anabaptist theology and probably the Anabaptist one, all things being equal. So I'm, uh, I don't believe we need national policy solutions in every instance, I think uh, local local solutions work, and, and I'm a big believer in that. So there are those local solutions, and they are happening. So, so I will pause, hopefully give us just a few minutes uh, for questions, but thank you. Well, it occurs to me that perhaps um, before I call on each of our presenters to uh, add additional comments, we call on the audience, we have about 10 minutes to follow up on the memory of Judge Noonan and his care and concern for the person in the law, to have you share your own experiences. Each of you must have had some event or some recollection that you might want to share with uh, the rest of us. Uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand over here from 2012 to 2013 for the judge. And <clears throat> in the spring of 2013 is when the Stash House case came across his desk. And he was consumed with it. And he, I would go to lunch with him. I loved going to lunch with the judge. And he asked me, you know, this, this, it seems like what the government did here is wrong. You should look at it. And I looked at it and not seeing kind of the full possibilities and really reading what he wanted, I said, you know, Judge, I don't know, the rule, the laws of entrapment are pretty broad. I mean, I just, I'm not sure there's a way around this. So he just went to a different clerk, right? <laughs> and so he went to the amazing Michelle Quo, who has since written an award-winning book. And they worked really deeply on this and she's a wordsmith. She's, you know, really an amazing writer and, um, I, th I would assume, you know, she's just very proud of what they put out, even though they were on the losing end of things. So I just thought I'd share the, oh, that anecdote. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. About 25 years ago, I, I got a telephone call from a friend of mine and, uh, who, uh, who had picked up a casual carpool uh, uh, rider from time to time. And he was, he was, uh, he was uh, very friendly and he chatted a lot. But, and she never knew who he was, but one day he left his briefcase in her car <laughs> and she opened it to find out and saw Judge Noonan. She called me here at Bolt and said, is, is there a Judge Noonan, is this guy for real? And I said, yes, you should, if you dig around there, call the federal courthouse and, uh, and he, he, you know, she called and he came over and picked up, picked up uh, the, uh, the, the briefcase, but, uh, but to, test, to, to attest to your notion that he, that he turned, to, turned to this. But I, I have another question. Uh, the, the talk, you talked about persons and empathy of the law, uh, but uh, I, I picked up, I picked up Persons and Masks of the Law. I think it must have been, I must have bought the first copy, uh, in, in, at least in New Haven at the time. And I've since given it to every one of my students, which are several, one right here, who was clerked uh, for Judge Noonan and said, read this. Because I said, had, had, uh, had uh, Ed Meese read Persons and Masks of the Law, uh, President Reagan never would have appointed him to the, uh, to, to, to the bench because uh, it, uh, 
it, it suggests that judges should be unpredictable, should, should look to the person. But you mentioned, you mentioned persons a lot, but I read persons and masks of the law to say ultimately masks trump persons. Ultimately, remember he quotes Augustine that, say, that's, that says, that say, that says um, uh, justice without, with only persons and without rules is tyranny. So ultimate, ultimately, ultimately, he's, he, he's constrained. In fact, two of the three examples, if not three of the examples you gave, uh, suggest that he used creative ways to come to the rule, to, to apply the rule, not to, not, to, not to circumvent it. So the question I've always asked, and I never had the courage to ask him, is this. Is, is, this, a, is this just part of the, Cath the tragic view of life in Catholic theology? We are imperfect, we, 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 have, we, we, can't, we need rules, we can't simply respond to the person, and we're, and we're in a sense schizophrenic, because that's the way I view, that's the way I view persons and masks of the law. He's rooting for persons, but ultimately, he doesn't reject masks. On the contrary, he can criticize the way people have done it, criticize Jefferson and, and Cardozo and others, but ultimately he comes down, you know, rules, rules are there. There's a, there's a limit to empathy, uh, and we have to, we have to uh, embrace rules if we're going to have any justice at all. So I wondered what, uh, what uh, people's thoughts on that is. I'm going to ask Julie to respond, and then uh, Richard will also have some thoughts, I'm sure. Julie? Well, I think you're absolutely right. And there, there are direct quotes out of Persons and Masks in the law about how this does not mean that, we can, that this isn't a legal, rule-based system. You know, I think luckily for us, he wasn't such a line drawer like the rest of us are. I think lawyers tend to be line drawers, like I'm going to put this in this category and it can only be in this category. I think that was one of his real gifts, was that he wasn't such a line drawer. I don't think it was an either or proposition for him. I don't think it was what trumps the other. I think it was a cohesive way of looking at law. And Richard, with your theology hat yeah. on. <laughs> yes. It, uh, venturing to, to pull back uh, there and noting that Jeff Powell will correct all of this if I go off the rails, um, who's in the room. But I think, and when we wrote, um, I wrote with Stanley Hauerwas on Judge Noonan's uh, f uh, judicial philosophy, which I think largely was, he didn't have one, um, <laughs> in terms of he, com he was committed to the person and in the story in front of him. But we did conjecture, because he came from such a rich intellectual tradition, you always argue within the story of the tradition. Um, there is, I think, a false view, and this is very much kind of Alistair McIntyre's work and Who's Justice, Which Rationality, and again, I'll just note that I'm 15 years out of date there, so I'm sure there's more recent things to, to cite to, that you can't improvisation is always only meaningful in the context of an ongoing tradition. So I don't, that's where I, I agree. I don't think there is a line that you go back and forth between. It is part of the tradition to argue within the tradition and then push the tradition to places it, it didn't realize it would otherwise go. Um, and I think he felt full license to do that. And I think that's also because he came from such a richly Catholic infused view. He, he didn't need to learn that in the way uh, a liberal, uh, someone who, f who came out of a liberalism tradition would have to figure out what a tradition was. Um, I, I saw another hand. Uh, Richard. Two weeks ago in the news, there was a story that they weren't going to provide flu shots in the detention centers. And another story that uh, they're deporting children with cancer to countries of origin where they're almost certain to die. I believe these uh, reports are true. Uh, what do you think Judge Noonan would have said of that? Yeah, and so ju just to clarify, on the deporting the children with cancer, that is the rule that they pulled back just four days ago. So they pr promulgated that, and it really wasn't even a promulgated rule, it was more they just sent letters to those individuals who were seeking deferments and said, you, your, your deferment will not be con considered, so you now have 33 days to vacate the country or be deported. And they now rescinded those letters. Um, yeah, I mean, and again, I, I'm, I'm, it's fraud, I think, to say what Judge Noonan would think. But I, I surely think if that case came before him, he um, would be appalled um, if, if he saw, and, and given the trajectory of his of his writing on, on immigration throughout those years. 
I saw another hand. Uh, all right. Yes. Good morning. My name is Patrick Brennan. I clerked for Judge Noonan in 1993 to 1994 um, with one of our hosts, Peter Stern. Um, one of the most memorable cases of the year was called Hardnet Against Marshall. It involved um, a man with some, some history of, of violence, and I'll call it bad behavior, who was at a party in a neighborhood in San Francisco, um, just south of Chinatown. And some, some people came from the area around Pier 39 and came into the room where the party was occurring and informed um, the man, Hardnet, um, that his girlfriend had just been, as Judge Noonan wrote in the opinion, dissed um, by people talking at Pier 39. As Judge Noonan went on to relate in the opinion, having been dissed, Hardnet and his companions, who were having implausibly but actually a fondue party, <laughs> picked up their fondue forks and knives, and Judge Noonan went on, armed with their domestic weaponry, <laughs> made their way to the Windsor Hotel, which happened to be just across the street from the court, although not where the court was sitting in 93 to 94. The, the, the appeal was decided, um, Hardnett, who had been convicted of stabbing his enemy, the one who'd done the dissing, now, now at the Windsor Hotel, 29 times with the fondue fork. It was a grisly case, and the, the issue on appeal involved, in, in part, whether there was time to form the mens rea for first degree murder between the area by Chinatown and the Windsor Hotel. I would tell all of that anyway, except for the postlude. After the appeal had been decided, the conviction affirmed, we all, Peter, Anton, and Evelyn at the wheel with Judge Noonan in the front seat, piled in Evelyn's van, drove to the apartment area where the crime had occurred, and drove along the possible route to the Windsor Hotel to see, as Judge Noonan said, whether there really had been time for this terrible killer to have formed the required mens rea. And, 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 and okay. what was the conclusion, though? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think on that note, un yeah. unless Julie or, or Richard has an additional point, we one, need to. One oh, okay. are we have time for one last comment? If I see, I don't see any hands, so I, oh, oh, there is one. I'm sorry. Yes, in the way back. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Shen Wajai. I clerked for Judge Noonan um, from 2004 to 2005. Um, it's an honor to, uh, to remember him this way. Um, my recollection of his uh, commitment to the human person is more in, in broad strokes. Uh, he gave, a, he, he, incoming clerks get a memo, um, very short memo on, on the way to do business in his chambers. And the one thing that really uh, uh, struck me and has stayed with me through my career was his insistence on, in our bench memos, referring to the parties by name rather than by plaintiff or defendant. And I think, uh, that really focuses the mind on the implications or the potential implications of the court's decisions. And that's really stayed with me. And uh, yeah. thank you. Very, very good observation. Yeah. Any, any uh, last minute comments from our speakers? If not, I want to thank everyone for their participation. I think everyone has shared in this first session of Law on the Person. Thank you very much. Yeah.